Bingo, we're back. And it's Tuesday. It feels like Monday after Labor Day. Uh, and we're doing, uh, I, guess, I guess we're doing uh, a Think Tech uh, Global today. Uh, and we're talking about some global issues with Dick Sim. Dick Sim uh, is a businessman. He was born and raised in Scotland. He studied engineering at Glasgow and Cambridge. He spent 30 years traveling the world, overseeing global industrial operations, uh, which included serving as the CEO and chairman of two uh, New York Stock Exchange public companies. He has an intimate knowledge of global capitalism, culture, and the role that technology plays in transforming society. He's a perfect guest for us at ThinkTech. He splits his time between Europe and the U.S., continues to be active in business, and uh, he has, a, a, I guess it's a blog, uh, freedomtoargue.com, and Freedom to Argue is also a book. It's available from Amazon and major booksellers. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dick. My pleasure, Jay. It's good to be here. I want to explore some of your thinking about this, and I guess it begins with uh, the fact that the world is changing faster than ever. That probably has a lot to do with, um, you know, information technology and telecommunications. Borders are coming down. Uh, societies that were comfortable before, maybe not so, much, not so much anymore, and disparity is raising its head all over the world. Have you noticed this? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious if you just want to look around you. I think some people have a very high level investment in the idea that with this nice global community, open borders, we're all multicultural, and we all get along like a happy family. Unfortunately, I think if you look around the world, reality is a lot different. I mean, I think the point of view I just expressed is pretty common in Europe because they're trying to put together 28 different countries and make them a happy family. And a lot of people in the U.S. view things the same way. But if you look around and say, what's Russia up to? What's China up to? What's Iran up to? What is Saudi Arabia up to? What is Turkey up to? You begin to realize there's a lot of people out there who really aren't invested in this view of the world. They're pursuing their own self-interest. And as they pursue their own self-interest, it causes lots of issues that we really have to look at hard on and deal with objectively and not have wishful thinking. So it... I think there's lots of evidence around, and I think Europe particularly is pretty interesting in terms of what's going on right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what's the change that concerns you most? I know there are all kinds of changes. We can list only some of them, and then we think of more. Um, and indeed, um, there are changes that we, we can't figure out the relationship of all these changes. But if I ask you, what's the one or the, the one or two that concern you most? Uh, that you see happening at a breakneck speed that are having the greatest effect, what would you say? Well, I think that, you know, there's uh, obviously an election going on here in the U.S. and there's an, uh, obviously a number of elections coming up in Europe. And for the, most people, the economy is always an overwhelming sort of concern. And that is not new, and the economy in Europe, and particularly the U.S., has not done that well the last 16 years. And so a lot of people are concerned about that. But that's sort of a, an ever-going concern. The, I think the new concern that has really come on the table uh, is really got to do with the clash between the fact, if you look at Europe and the U.S., we're breeding below our replacement rate. So that says if we don't have immigration, our populations are going to decline. We're very, very rich nations, and particularly Europe, when it looks at the next door neighbors, the Middle East and Africa, you see populations there are probably going to double in size in the next 30, 40 years. If you look at the GDP per capita of Europe compared to, say, sub saharan Africa, it's 22 times higher. And, you know, if I'm a guy down in Africa, as I once was a guy in Scotland, you look around and you say, gee, Things aren't too good down here. I got a dictatorship running the country. Uh, population is exploding. I'm hardly making any money. And just up the road here in Europe, there's a ton of money, and they don't need, they don't have enough people. I think I'll go up there. And so you're seeing this movement of refugees, and it's a big issue in Europe uh, in terms of the Muslim immigration, in particular, coming out of the Middle East and Africa. And the U.S. Although it seems further away, and we might think the Atlantic Ocean insulates us. With today's modern air travel, uh, it's not that hard to get to Mexico. It's not that hard to fly into New York City in a visitor's uh, visa. 
and become uh, an illegal immigrant. And the refugee in Europe, some people view this as a Syrian thing. It existed before the Syrian war, and it will continue for the next 30, 40 years. And I think that we need some reality in our terms of way view it. And I think both Europe and the USA really need to control the borders, or they're going to be overwhelmed. And I, I really believe that. I, I don't think it's a scare story uh, at all. And you're starting to see Europe uh, do that, but this issue is tearing Europe apart because Angela Merkel and the European Commission really aren't in line with a lot of the, the, the nations. And, yeah. you know, I think particularly yeah. the Brexit vote in the UK, yeah. all yeah. Eastern Europeans are against Muslim immigration. There's legislative proposals right now and Denmark and Austria to ban all Muslims. The anti-Muslim party in Holland now attempts their platform for the next elections next year. They want to ban all mosques. So this thing is coming to a boil in, uh, in Europe in terms of confronting something that's been creeping up on them for the last 50 years. Because Muslim immigration really yeah. started in Europe 50 years ago and it's taken them a long time to get to this point. U USA is way behind them and we could we could actually benefit a lot by just looking at what's happened in Europe, how it happened and what we can learn from it. Yeah well but how, how do you see it unfolding? I mean uh, you can say that there would be legislation or governmental attempts to limit um, migration and uh, for that matter to uh, reinstate borders. I mean borders have have been mm, largely dissolved in Europe uh, among the EU. Um, reinstate borders, the whole notion of borders, but um, will that work? At the end of the day, I think what I get from you is that um, we, have, we have a disparity between uh, wealth in some places and lack of wealth in other places, and th these processes, it's like water. Water is finding a way. Uh, it's an equalization, a global equalization to, to uh, you know, to adjust the, to equalize, democratize, if you will, the disparity. And so uh, isn't that going to happen? Isn't that inevitable, however painful it may be for the guys who have more money now? I, I think that's a reasonable thought, and I think the pressures to equalize are very much there. But the, the issue is what is the price? And, you know, if you say, okay, let's look at the United States. We've got 300 and 15 million people. We allow in legally about a million a year. We don't really know how many illegal people come in a year, and even the government admits that. But if I were to say to you, GJ, do you think we could allow in 20 million people next year? I think most people would pause and say, gee, that sounds like an awful lot. I think that's maybe a problem. So. We are talking about down in Africa, if we were to send over some planes and give them an invitation, you probably get 100 million people would jump on the planes and want to come over here. So the numbers are overwhelming. So there needs to be uh, some practical limits. And the reason people keep coming is because we're, we really welcome. If you look at Angela Merkel, you look at President Obama, Basically, they're saying, come on over here, come in as an illegal refugee, and we will be hospitable. And they will keep coming as long as the opportunity is there. And of course, we should have legal immigration. This country, USA, needs legal immigration. Europe needs legal immigration. But we need to discourage what is, can be an overwhelming flow of refugees. And let me give you and altruistic reasons why we should want to do that. Please. If you look at why Western civilization and the wealth of the West has increased over the last 40, 50 years, it's really driven by technology. It's yes. driven by computers. Yes. It's driven by software. It's driven by iPhones. It's driven by the internet. It's driven by a, a, a lot of medical technology, a whole ton of things. Where did most of this come from? It came from the USA. We have a, a system in the USA of uh, creating new technology, creating wealth, and we tend to take it for granted. And we tend to think it's not fragile. We tend to think it's always going to be there for us. <laughs> and and, and it, I don't think we should be so cavalier. So when you look at our biggest gift 
to ourselves and the rest of the world, our biggest gift is our ability to lead the world in terms of providing all this technology which improves productivity, improves standard living, brings wealth to the world. Our global trade, which we're a big part of, creates jobs in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, India, and it's a major reason why poverty is you know, going down in these countries and people are getting wealthier. That is our contribution to the world. And if by inviting in 100 million people who really don't know into the country, we blow that up, we're blowing up the world. So this is not purely, it is partly selfish, but it's not purely selfish. It is a matter of, we have a model that works. It's a very important model for the people who live here. But it's also a very important more model for the rest of the world. And we have a, a responsibility, a global responsibility, I would argue, to uh, advance it, protect it, and of course let in immigrants. But let's let in the ones we choose, let in the ones that are legal. I mean, I came to this country as an immigrant. I mean, I understand what that's all about. Uh, it's not easy, but there's lots of people who want to come here. And of course we're going to do legal immigration. But the legal, uncontrolled immigration, even though the pressure is there, Jay, just the way you described it, it, is, it can be very damaging, not only to us, but to the world. Well, let me, uh, let me ask you, uh, you're talking about freedom and you're talking about making the argument, maybe you could help us with what is freedom to argue? Your, your book, your blog, um, what is that all about? What are you saying there? Well, the banner of freedom to argue really... Uh, is suggesting that because of the politically correct world we live in, we really are blocked in so many places, and particularly white men like you, G, are blocked from talking about a lot of things because we initially go to name calling and talk past people. And we have a lot of real issues in society. There's issues that need to be brought on the table and civilly discussed. And we need to argue with each other to find out what really is right and what's wrong and move from there to... You're talking about candor. Right. You're, not, you're talking about something other than being politically correct. Correct. Absolutely. That's what I, I think we need. It's an important starting point to move any ideas forward. So that's the banner of freedom to argue. Okay. Below that, the subtitle, We the People versus the Government. <laughs> yeah, that's one of your points, isn't it, to, to have less government. Let's take a short break. Uh, that's Dick Sim. We're talking about global capitalism and regulation. We're going to get to that part of the conversation right after this very short break. Aloha, my name is Danelia D. A N E L I A. And I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha! Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Okay, we're here with Dick Sim. He joins us by, uh, by Skype, Skype video and audio. Sky uh, Dick, where are you anyway? I'm right now in Wisconsin. I've got a business here and I'm up here doing a, trying to do a little capitalism. <laughs> that's, that's what I love about doing Skype on ThinkTech. It really doesn't matter where you are. You could be anywhere and we get to talk to you. That's wonderful. So uh, we talked about the disparity, disparity in wealth, disparity in... Uh, I don't know, uh, technology, there's so many disparities. And, and of course, the natural flow of humanity, like water, the old Chinese uh, you know, proverb is Shui Dao Chu Chung, the water will find a way, the people will find a way. And it, it, it seems like it's been equalizing, maybe through the, 
generosity and the welcomeness of people like Angela Merkel. Um, but uh, over time, that may not be sustainable. So I, I pose to you the possibility uh, that the developing world, instead of you know, uh, coming to the developed world and um, equaling things that way, leveling things that way, uh, if, if the capital interests would invest more in the developing world to build it up, to build the, the industries, to build the schools, uh, you know, to build the medical and the technological advances, telecommunication, uh, and you know, therefore equalize things that way, uh, we, we wouldn't have to worry so much about borders and migration, would we? We would not. And I think you're right to go in the direction of saying, what do we do to have to help these people where they are? And if you look around the world today, I mean, obviously the West, uh, Western Europe and North America are well-developed, thriving economies, so Australia, New Zealand, and a few other places. Asia's all going in the right direction. They have a capitalistic model which I think is, mirrors a lot of things in, in Europe and, and the USA, and that's developing nicely. And so is South America. Most people don't want to leave where they're born. Most people don't want to emigrate. Emigrating is hard, mainly because you leave your family behind. So people only emigrate if things are really bad. And I think where we have problems are the Middle East in the non-oil producing countries and in Africa. And Again, this is one of these areas where it's politically incorrect to even talk about it. But I will talk about it. If you look at Africa, uh, the great hope in Africa was South Africa. And I was very hopeful when Nelson Mandela made the transition and turned it into democracy, got beyond apartheid thing. And I think South Africa had a lot of potential because it had some real established industries in there. It had uh, a fair amount of people who experience running these businesses. Unfortunately, South Africa has gone downhill in the last, you know, 15 years. Zuma, who's running it right now, is slipping into the model of your typical African leader, somewhat dictator, somewhat corrupt, uh, and the economy isn't doing well. They're not meeting the needs of their people, so there's new political parties rising to change them. And that was the great hope. If you look around the rest of Africa, to Zimbabwe, going all the way up to Central Africa Republic, all these places, pretty much all the people that run them, they're tribal cultures. The government is basically corrupt. And to a large extent, Africa, in my mind, is a failed state. Now, we can't say that. Why can't we say that? Because if you come out of Europe, that's where all these countries really were ex-colonies are. Now, even though they were made independent in the 50s and 60s, if we in Europe call Africa a failed state, they're going to say, hey, that's because of you guys who were colonial masters. You, you, you caused this. And so we don't talk about it. And it's very hard to help uh, African countries. The country that's probably doing most is China. They're making a lot of investments. Yes, in they are. And they're, and they're showing and us the way. They're showing the West the way on how to invest in Africa, and they're making real traction there. Well, they're, and they're doing it for their self-interest. They sure. want access to capitalities. And, you know, they know how to play that game. And they'll probably be reasonably successful. Uh, in the United States, if you're an American business, you, you have an anti-corruption uh, laws. We can't do things that some other people can do. We can't play games in terms of throwing money around to advance our self-interest. But just getting access to commodities is not going to solve the problem for the mass of our African people. So Africa is very difficult to know how to help it. People like Bill Gates with his foundation are doing some sterling work over there. But when you funnel money through the governments, it tends to disappear and not get to the people. So to get to the people is very difficult. And I really don't have a solution. The other part of the problem is the Middle East. And if you look at the Middle Eastern countries, uh, the only majority Muslim country that's really done well in the last, say, 40, 50 years is Turkey. And that's because in 1923, there was a guy called Ataturk, who was a big general who won independence, and he's very determined to set up Turkey as a secular state. But by that, I mean separation of Islam from the government, a separate judiciary, and to try and treat everyone equally under the law. And since 1923, it took him 
number he only died in 1938 so he didn't put that whole constitution in overnight he did over a number of years because obviously it, uh, it was difficult to do but he put in a really nice constitution and the army was left to make sure that constitution was abided by and the army intervened a number of times and Turkey under that secular model has done very well over the last yes. 40, 50 years. It's developed into a nice industrial country. The wealth of has gone up good, and and many many people have benefited. How, how is it happening? How is it working now with uh, Erdogan? It's. I'm very concerned. I mean, I think Erdogan is a devout Muslim. When he was, he he ran for the Islamist party in the mid 1990s. Became mayor of Istanbul about 1994. A couple of years later, he was sentenced to prison for Islamist, uh, radical Islamist thoughts. When he came out of prison, because he'd been convicted, he was no longer qualified to hold political office. In the early 2000s, he created the AKP party, it was a new party. They ran, they won, they became the, the governing majority. He put in his friend as the prime minister, they passed the law saying that Erdogan was forgiven for his you know, criminal charge and could become an MP, and he became MP overnight. And so he's been in charge of running Turkey since about 2003, 2004. And he's become a strong man, and the, that doesn't seem consistent with the kind of uh, um, uh, democracy that Ataturk had in mind, no? That is absolutely correct. And the Erdogan story is, is mixed. He did a really good job of growing the economy. And that's why lots of people in Turkey love him, because uh, the standard of living went up, everyone did well. He did a really good job, but he, for the last short period of time, few years, has been on a, a program to make Turkey a more Islamist country. If you follow his speeches in Turkey, I mean, he makes speeches about he thinks women should stay in the home, have at least three children, things like this, which to a modern feminist in New York, might seem a little odd. And he right now clearly is going to try to change the constitution. And we don't quite know what he's going to change it to. He's made it clear that's what he's doing. And if you want to be a little suspicious about everything that's happened over there, I, I think one can be entitled to do that. The, obviously the reason it was a coup is the army has always been the protector of the constitution in Turkey similar to what the role it plays in Egypt. The, the army's there, they stay out of it, but if they see the country going in the wrong direction, they're willing to step in. And unfortunately, this time, the coup was unsuccessful. And Erdogan is turning the whole country into a police state and uh, is really going after it. And it's going to take another year or two to see how that all plays well, out. Well, it's troublesome in the sense that uh, this seems largely for vanity and power, what he's doing. Um, at the same time, Turkey is a, is a keystone to the whole Middle East. And if Turkey fails in some way, if it fails to be, um, you know, a, a moderate Western type state, uh, a secular state, if you will, um, that has implications all around the area, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, if you look at it on a geopolitical level, yeah, Turkey was on path to become a member of the European Union. They were in a process of trying to qualify themselves. They're a member of NATO. We have an air base there. To, they were using the USS as an air base they've been using to fly sorties into Syria. What's happening now? He's cozying up to Russia. He's, Turkish troops have moved into north east Syria. And the reason they're doing that is really to clear out the Kurds. I mean, Erdogan has had a, a war off and on again against the Kurds who live within his own country. And now he was afraid of the Kurds who were coming in from the Turkish end, the, from the Iraq end, were going to occupy northern Syria and declare their own country. So he's moved in to clear them out, and it's complicating the whole Syria thing immensely. And I don't think anyone knows what's yeah. going to really well, happen. How, how does this fit with your general philosophy, which I take it is uh, it's better uh, to have less government regulation, less government power. Uh, it's better to return to some more, mm, uh, oh, I don't know, non-governmental approach, a free will kind of approach. Um, instead, but here you have Turkey, a critical player in the Middle East, um, where the government has got greater power. 
Uh, how does it play into your, your world view, Dick? Well, I think we need uh, what I would call real politics. And so if you look at it from a U.S. point of view, we need to look out there and see people who are developing the right way. And we reward them. And when people are developing ways that are counterproductive to our interests, our global interests, we isolate them. And over a long period of time, and I'm talking decades, that's the only thing you can do. You can't force people to change, but you can reward those who do the right things and, you, and maybe punish is too strong a word, but you can isolate people who do the wrong things. And, and I think that's really from a foreign policy point of view, what we need to do and we need to remain strong. And this goes back to the idea that we need to remain a strong country. You're talking so about the U.S., U.S. policy. Are you talking about European policy too? Are you talking about Germany, France, England? I'm, I'm mainly talking about the U.S. I think the, the Europeans, uh, it's not really clear that the Europeans have a coherent foreign policy. There are 28 countries get together with the European Commission in a room. They don't all agree. So because they don't all agree, it's hard for them to have a coherent policy. The United States, because we have leadership uh, or structure, can have uh, you know, a real foreign policy that's specific and targeted. And I think we need to, again, go back to this idea that uh, of what is real versus what we hope. And obviously, you know, uh, President Obama from the beginning having had a Muslim father, uh, having spent up to age 10 in Indonesia. Uh, obviously his mother, I, I assume, liked Muslims. I think he grew up with a fairly benign idea of, of Islam. And that's fair enough, because if you look at Islam in Indonesia, it's not the very conservative Salafi well, Islam. Well, whatever, whatever Obama's doing now, he's a short timer. You know, in, in uh, four months, uh, he's, he's out right. of office. And so, if you want to look uh, to American foreign policy to, to a change in some way in American foreign policy, you have to look to the next president, which is likely to be uh, either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. So, you know, just to wrap up on this, if we don't have a minute left, um, which way do you feel we ought to go? Uh, should we go to Trump? I mean, he's got, he's got views about borders. Would you go to Clinton? She's got experience in foreign policy. Uh, which one would more aptly suit you know, the, the kind of direction you'd like to have. Yeah, um, that's a difficult choice, okay. The, but clearly Hillary is part of why we have a mess throughout the Middle East. Uh, and so you would, based on that, say, well, let's go with Trump. Obviously, one of the problems we all have with Trump is we're not absolutely sure what he would do or exactly how we do it. But I think it's a, a reasonable bet because I really do think uh, we need to if you listen to what Trump says, and, and, and again, there's always this question of, can you be certain really what he would do? But uh, this idea of uh, concentrating the U.S. interests, knowing who our friends are, and being fairly tough with people who aren't playing the game is the basis of a sound foreign policy. And I think that the world needs that leadership from the United States because lacking that leadership you know, we kind of get what we have today. <laughs> That's uh, Dick Sim on global capitalism and regulation. He's a businessman um, involved in some New York Stock Exchange public companies. Now, having joined us uh, from Wisconsin um, on Skype, and we so appreciate his views of the matter. Food for thought, food, food, food for thought. Uh, thank you so much, Dick. Thanks for joining us. It's been interesting to talk to you. You're welcome, Jay. I enjoyed it, too. Aloha.